Okay. All right. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, I am Tara Borland. So for most of you, I'm the one who you've been emailing or getting emails from since about October, November, um, working on putting this together. I really appreciate everyone's um, enthusiasm about the event. It is brand new to everybody at UAF that's running it. So bear with us. Like we are, we are going through all of the, the learning curve just as much as everybody else um, trying to put this together. And we're just, we're really hoping to make this an annual event at UAF um, and expand it to high schools in the next few years. Um, but so I'm going to turn it over to Dan and John. So they're with the national team. Um, and so they've agreed to put on this kind of Q&A for you guys, um, because there's just a lot of questions that I don't have exact answers to because I'm as new as you guys. Um, so these guys are our resident experts and um, hopefully um, they can answer all of our questions. Um, so I will turn it over to you guys. All right. Thanks, Tara. Um, only take a moment and we'll do a little introductions and um, so you know a little bit about us and kind of what we do here at Science Olympiad. And to that end, I'll ask Dan to start. Um, all right. Welcome. Um, I'm Dan Nichols. Um, I am the new National Science Olympiad Program Director. Um, I came on in August. Um, before that, I was a high school biology teacher for 27 years, um, coached Science Olympiad for about 25 of those, um, pretty successful coach. Uh, we were able to actually take a team to the national tournament one year um, in 2014. So um, I uh, got involved with Science Olympiad when I was a high school student. I competed for one year in high school and um, I... Uh, actually went ahead and started the team at Whiting. And um, then I got involved with the state board, became a, a, the state board um, representative for our regional and worked my way up to state director. Um, I became the national um, inquiry committee chair after being national event supervisor for a few years uh, for Game On and that. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my resume. Um, at the national office, um, I'm the coordinator between the host site and the, the national office for the national tournament, help with the, the event rules, and um, basically do whatever else they need me to do at the national office, uh, in charge of alumni chapters and um, communicating with the state directors and that. So that's my job. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. And I'm John Lohr. I've... Uh... I'm at the national office and I work on with our event supervisors and our committees to do the, the rules and kind of figure out what we're going to do every year, as well as handle a lot of the professional development um, for our coaches and do sort of other program outreach to our partners. Um, so glad you guys have all um, decided to take, take the challenge uh, and come on board this year and we're here to kind of help out and answer whatever questions we have you guys have and kind of point you to uh, resources and things that might make it a little bit easier um, working with your kids. All right. Um, to that end, Tara sent us a couple of questions um, to in advance that she'd been getting a lot of from everybody. So is it, a, would that be a good place to start or do you guys want to start firing questions at us? Seeing no one speak up while well, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll start tackling the, the stuff. So um, the one question and the, the, the final one, I think is probably the one that makes the most sense to start and is terra phrase that is, let me see if I get it right. All right. So what does Science Olympiad look like in action? All right. In the best way, the best analogy I've ever heard um, for Science Olympiad is, is it the activity is essentially an academic track meet. So if you've ever 
been around track or known anyone that does track, it's, you know, you have all these multiple events and people will compete in the individual events. And then the performance across all the events for a, a given team goes into figuring out which team did best at the track meet. And that's essentially what we do with Science Olympiad. There are 23 events. I don't know why it ended up being 23. Um, History-wise, it I, I, there must have been like, I'm sure it's something as dumb as there was a year when they were trying to settle on how many events should be and they couldn't make a decision. So they said, oh, heck with it, we'll just do 23. And it's stuck ever since then. But the beauty of the format is it allows us to tackle um, essentially six big buckets of science. So there's biology and life science events. There's earth and space events. There's physical science being chemistry and physics. We have a whole category of technology and engineering. And then last but not least is a holdover from the science standards of the 90s. We have a, what we call the inquiry um, category. And this is a lot of activities that don't fit neatly into the, the other five buckets. All right. Um, so far, does that kind of make sense? So the idea is schools will form teams. They'll sh they assign kids to compete in these events. And for the most part, all of the events have you, you compete with a partner. So it's two kids for every event. And when the tournament date, and if I'm right, Tara, you guys are going to be the 24th, February 24th. All right. So February 24th, you go to the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. And there'll be, a, you'll check your team in, Tara will give you information. There'll be a schedule for the day telling you when different events are taking place. When an event gets called, so they say, okay, it's anatomy and physiology at 9 a.m. in the life sciences building. You send your two anatomy and physiology kids there. They go compete for an hour. When... If there's another event going on at the same time, those kids go off to a different location and compete. Then you just kind of go through the day, do all the events. Now I know um, you guys, I think if I remember right, are gonna do it a little bit differently and you're gonna go over um, to Friday and Saturday. Am I right for so it'll be a little more spread out for you guys, which is really nice. Um, normally, uh, down here in the, the continental US, most of our tournaments, though, a super long day uh, for everybody. And you'll, you know, you're usually on college campus for a, close to 12 hours. Um, and that's kind of the, the general format. Uh, Dean, you got any, anything else to? No, I, I think you, you, you've hit it all pretty well there, John. Um, I, I like to think of it maybe uh, as a gymnastics competition. It just seems like there's a lot more action going on with gymnastics and there's all kinds of craziness going on, flips and all that stuff happening. And that's kind of what I think of with Science Olympiad. Lots of, lots of craziness all in, in a contained area. If you if you guys want, um, I can share our very draft schedule right now so you guys can kind of see what it's going to look like. I'll see if, if it'll let me share screen. Yeah, yeah. Just made you a co-host, so you should be able to share, Tara. Okay. So this is kind of what we've put together. Um, the general like idea that it's going to, things will start at 830 and kind of go through, we'll, we'll probably stay the same when the different competitions are happening might change, right? So you can see, we, we kind of have a couple of, we have two for every hour. Um, and that's gonna be based on, we're working on assigning different rooms to them. And we kind of want to do what makes sense per location at the university so that we're not like sending everybody all over the place at any given time. 
So we might mix and match what, what events are happening in the same hour, but for the most part, this is kind of what it's going to look like. Um, this is the first day. And so you can kind of see, we have an opening ceremony. Um, we're going to do breakfast. We have a little bit, it's a little bit different for everybody because we're, we have the dorms. So we're hoping all the teams will stay the night. So we'll probably do a check-in a little bit earlier than that to get everybody kind of set into the dorm space and then breakfast and then opening ceremony and then starting into the events. Um, and then if I go down here, day two, it's, it's similar, um, you know, we kind of have breakfast starting and then we go to a couple hours of the final events and then the award ceremony at the end. Um, so does anyone um, have any questions about like kind of that general agenda? Uh, this is Joy. I just have a quick question. Um, so if there are two events are happening at the same time, so we had to make sure you know, none of our kids assigned exactly the two events at the same time. I guess it's like for people who have went through that, how do you assign the kids, you know, ahead of time without knowing the schedule, the things, you know, what happened if it's a kid that happened to be um right. You know, yeah. So at the thinking. same time. Yeah, if you have a kid who wants to do the two that are assigned together, I'm hoping okay. that it won't happen. We're gonna try um, and get this to you guys sooner than later. We've just been kind of working on figuring out rooms and spaces um, and making sure we have the right rooms assigned to the right type of event and then kind of put something together and share with you guys. And then you can kind of look at it with your teams. And if we have any like real big issues, um, hopefully we can address and manipulate it a little bit to make sure that that goes away. I, I'm, I'm hoping since our event is small enough, we should be able to to make it work for everybody. So okay. Tara, this is Sue Phillips. Um, can say, say we are doing meteorology or whatever, are we mm -hmm. only allowed to have two kids do that? So of our team, only four kids are busy at one time. If you have two events. Right. What yeah. are the other kids doing? So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna put to Jan, J John and Dan who have seen the event in action. <laughs> So as a coach, um, to uh, actually get the, the students um, busy, we would always bring study materials, have the kids working on that. And I also saw that you had some of the sign-up times down at the bottom, Tara, for um, the build events. Um, so there may be a couple of kids that are doing that. Um, some of the kids could be at those venues watching. So if your, your flying kids aren't busy and aren't doing an event, you may want to have them there watching the other teams flying and seeing how that goes or at one of the other builds observing that seeing what what the the apparatus is how they're testing and, and doing stuff like that um kind of doing a little reconnaissance um on that um having the kids do some studying uh for their events prepping getting ready for their next event making sure they've got everything ready is always a good thing um and the, the kids usually find something to occupy their time, um, whether it's on their phone or whether they are, um, you know, playing cards or a, a game or whatever, um, depending so, on, on the team atmosphere. So we'll have a central place where they're all getting dispersed from and. Yeah, we're really hoping to have most of these um, events happening in one building as much as possible. Um, and then there's a couple there's a couple other buildings that we're going to be using just because we need like a larger space for the build events. Um, so it's all going to be kind of in a general location. So we're going to have kind of a home base where we can be at and then um, kind of going from there. And all of these buildings have common spaces. Um, so we can probably, you know, if, if we're at the eLife building for the next couple of events, you know, we can get everybody set up in the common space there. And then kind of that would be the home base going from here to there. And we're hoping to have a lot of volunteers on hand as well to, you know, kind of be there to help coaches and students and making sure everybody's getting to where they need to be at the right time. Yeah, okay. that was my, this is, this is Brooke. That was kind of my question. I wanted to know what was our team holding area like, or are we going to have like a table and a, like a common cafeteria area, or were we going to have rooms where we can um, be between events? What, what were we going to, these are middle school students, right? I got a lot of 12 and 13 year olds. 
um, who, you know, and they're, they're the best of the best, but um, still maturity is what it is. So, I mean, do we have escorts who can help kids get to and from events? Um, are coaches allowed to be in the event or are volunteers allowed to be in the event? Because you mentioned watching. And, um, and when I, the, the one time I did one event as a support coach eight years ago, um, they, they they weren't, they didn't let anybody in except for the kids. Right. Um, so Brooke, the way it typically works is, um, only the kids are allowed in the, well, yeah, typically it's only the kids allowed in the event space. There are some events that are because of their very nature are public and showy so like flight um the the vehicle um so for you guys it'd be wheeled vehicle those events because they take place in big open spaces while the only the kids are allowed to be down in the competition area other people will be in the bleachers or the stands or depending upon how the space works, you know, we've, we've had people like in a, think of it like run events in a big foyer where there's like a couple of floors of tiers and balconies overlooking and you've had spectators around the balcony. Um, but right. what, are they all going to be in the same building or are they going to have to walk outside in February? I mean, end of February, will start warming up a little bit, but it'll still be, should still be pretty cold. I just, yeah. Think there, logistics, do I need to have them bring their snow clothes and stuff? Yeah, there will be a little bit of walking from building to building, but we're we're trying to get them kind of really all almost right next to each other. So it'll be, it won't be like a long trek. Um, if there is reason for us to have a longer trek, then we will have a shuttle to, to get the kids, a heated shuttle to get them um, there and back. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry about them being outside for too long, but there will be a little bit of time, you know, going from one building to the next potentially. Um, but then for the other events, just real quick is like, you can have adults take them from your home base or wherever you have the team set up. And then typically what uh, you'll see, and it's, it's very common. Um, we you always know what room a middle school event is taking place in because there will be uh, literally dozens of adults packing the hallway, waiting for their children to come out of the out of the event space. So it's perfectly fine for then the, the adults to kind of hang out or go find a, you mean, I don't know what the facilities um, at Alaska Fairbanks look like. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to sell Jenny on the idea of Dan and I coming up for this event yet. Um, though we're, we haven't given up hope. Um, like if there's a common area at the, like, you know, if there's a common space on the floor somewhere, the adults can go kind of hang out and wait for the hour while the kids are in competing. I have one more question. Uh, um, so the kids are working on a team of two. Are they working on a single like paper document or are they working on a shared computer document? For like the one, how does that work? It's typically, it, it, it's typically a um, shared paper document. Um, and it's really comes down to the person who's running the event. Um, but the typical advice we th that we give to the kids, it's essentially a long paper and pencil. It's most often a long paper and pencil test. And if that's the case, what we have the, the one of the questions the kids should ask is, does the event supervisor care if they split the test up? And then essentially you do like, you know, if Dan and I are competing together, we kind of find the midpoint in the test. We pull it apart. So the staple pops. I have the first set of pages. Dan gets the back set of pages. I'll work all the questions in my section that I know the answers to. Dan does the same for his. When we hit the end, we exchange. We then go through and kind of fill in the blanks, double check our work. And then we use the rest of the time to argue and fight over the answers we disagree on or try and figure out what the best guess is. Now, the downside- Are they not scratch paper? Or are they gonna be like talking? It, they the are, they're typically um, talking, right? <laughs> so it's, you know, they're, they're 
seated next to each other. So it's um, kind of indoor voices and, and whispering and, you know, kind of pointing and, and stuff. The one thing though, Tara, if you want, if your supervisor is gonna allow them to pull the tests apart, you're gonna make need to make sure everybody's got a bunch of staplers. Um, Cause obviously you gotta recombine everything um, is the easiest way to handle that. Um, Are they allowed to have one cheat sheet per person or just one per, per it, team? It, Brooke, it depends upon the particular event. And so let me, uh, bear with me one second, and I want to pull. Um, there we go. We'll pull one up. While you're looking for that, that actually goes really well with what I was curious about. We have the opposite problem. We have we are a very very small school and might only have one or two students who are coming. It sounds like everything is pretty much a team event, though, and we would be at uh, quite a disadvantage if you have just one student taking a test and when every other team has got two students working together. Um, yes and no. Um, we, the biggest issue that I think teams experience when it comes to the events and the number of kids is in a real big tournament, we'll have three, three or four events running in the same hour. So it's more a coverage problem and having enough kids to cover all the events but we have plenty we have plenty of places that will just do single kids in events um because the thing you got to remember is the way the the format works is that um kids get not only the they'll get recognized for their performance within an event right as well as across, then the group gets recognized for their performance across all the events. So, I mean, it's really being there and competing is, uh, I mean, sort of the, the key element, not necessarily how many, um, how many kids you have or um, that, but back to Brooke's question. So this is, I pulled up the, anatomy and physiology rules for middle school. And if you look at it right here in, number, in section number two for all of our events and all the rules tell you what's permissible for an event. So what the kids can have with them. The other thing that event parameters will do often is they will also tell you what the event supervisor is going to make available to the kids. And I'll, I'll show that to you in another event here in a second. But if we read this, so for anatomy and physiology, each team, so, okay, we're talking team, so that's for um, two kids, one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, right? Which you can put it in a sheet protector but if it's in a sheet protector, it's got to be taped or laminated at the top. You can have information on both sides of the paper. That information can be in any form. So they can, they can write notes. They can photocopy and shrink a page out of their textbook and paste that page on the, on, you know, tape it on the paper, glue it on the paper any of that stuff from any source. So it could be from a book printed off the internet, um, a page out of a mag, you know, something from a magazine, doesn't matter, right? Now- Can, the only can thing they type they, it? They can be typed, any form. Now, the only thing they're not allowed to do is they're not allowed to affix anything to the page. So- <clears throat> No annotations, no sticky notes. So it's like, if you could see, I can't have my one page of paper and cover the outside of it with post-it notes, right? I get, hang on. So basically oh. that rule is so that you can't increase the service area yeah. of your resource sheet. So this, would, this, if this was my resource sheet would be perfectly legal. Second I do that, that sticky note would makes it illegal and the event supervisor would want to take it off, would tell me to take it off and throw it away. So does that make sense so far? 
it, it kind of does. Are we going to get like these sheets that tell us specifically what they're supposed to be able to know or want to have on their cheat sheet or anything? Yeah, the rules are, all the rules are online and we'll put the, um, Dan, will I find the next event? Can Got it. Drop the and link in when the chat. Everybody was sent an email with the rules manual and that has all of these in there as well. Um, so then I want to do, so let's see. Ah. Um, so here, I mean, it's just to show you the difference. So bridge, this is a building event and you can see the event parameters are a little bit different. Okay. It tells you you're allowed one, right? One structure built before the competition. So you need to show up with the bridge, right? They have to have eye protection. So they gotta be wearing goggles. Um, they are not allowed to bring levels or squares. The event supervisor is gonna provide the te test apparatus that's explained later in the, the rules. And there was another, um, and this kind of goes to an, another question that got submitted, right? The event supervisor may ask the kids questions or the kids will ha need the ability to talk about um, what they're bringing in. So answer questions like, how'd you build it? Where'd you get the idea? Um, like uh, what else, what choice, you know, like why'd you pick those materials? Um, anything that makes it certain that the kids built the bridge or the kids built the plane and it wasn't built by um, mom or dad. And then mom or dad handed it to him and goes, here guys, take this with you to the tournament. Good luck, I'm breaking it. All right, so does that, you guys notice that difference and does that be okay with that distinction? And then if we go to an event like, um, ah, perfect, Crave the Wave under event parameters, Crave the Wave tells you, you can have a team gets one three ring binder. That binder can be of any size, any information, any form, any source. Now, the only catch is you got to attach it using the rings. So they just can't have loose pages shoved in the binder, right? You can sheet protector, laminate it, tabs, labels, all that stuff is perfectly okay. During the event, so back to the example, Dan and I are competing as partners. I need, a, I'm working on a question and I need pages from the front of the binder. Dan needs the binder and he needs pages from the back of the binder. It's perfectly okay for us to open that binder up and just pull those pages out. Also, I can bring anything to write with, a protractor, ruler, and we're allowed to have two calculators of any kind. Everybody, and every event you're, is going to have this event parameter section that describes this kind of stuff. The one thing I will call your attention to is towards the back. In the back of the manual, whoop, that's the chemistry lab equipment. Here we go. Here's a page that describes what kind of what we're talking about when the different kinds of calculators that are allowable. And there's a chart that goes along with that. And there's also a page at the back of the book that describes everything about the goggles and what kind of goggles um, are required. Yeah. Um, yeah, and definitely we have some page, we have sample pages for a, a build log um, up on the website. And I will tell you if you haven't, um, well, I have it real quick. 
On the Science Olympiad website. You can, um, if you go under menu, we have a, a web page dedicated to every event that has additional information and resources um, for teams to use. So here is, we'll grab flight. It's got score sheets, checklists. We got a whole bunch of different videos about um, doing it. There's a, a link to how to build the plane. Here is a sample um, model, tips on how to make the, um, how to, you know, just build the plane and put it together, um, all sorts of stuff like that. And Tara, there's, if on every one of the pages will be the link to the logistics manual that tells your event super, gives your event supervisor some tips on how to run the event and answer some questions they may have about running the event. All right, hopefully, does that help with, the question about okay, how do I know what I can bring in and what the kids are allowed to have? So that eighty-page thing you were looking at when that you were showing us is that we put that together from all those little links on that other page, or is it concise as one document someplace? No, it is. It is concise as one document, and that's the thing I believe Tara says she actually emailed to you already. Um, yeah. So once everybody registered, I sent the, the division B rules manual and that has that the rules for every, every um, event in there, but it has all 23. And so I think I listed out what 16 events we're doing. So you knew to focus on those ones. Is okay. it possible to send that again, Tara? Okay. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And you can download the, the same thing with the link that I put on, um, in the chat yeah that's where you can download the oh, rules okay. straight from our website <clears throat> it just doesn't have the 16 that, that you guys are focusing on in alaska yeah that's the only catch is it it shows you everything that people are working with nationally and because it's early on you're just doing the the 16 um that terrorists flagged and to joy's question that just popped up I'm sure that's in the email and Tara will make sure everybody's aware of it. Plus you'll see that when the schedule comes out, right? Because the schedule has to list out all the events that are happening. <laughs> yeah, Joy, I'll send you, um, I don't think you were on the original email to your team. So I'll make sure you get that. And um, and for Suzanne, are you Suzanne one or two? I'm, <laughs> I'm, one, I'm one. Okay, thanks. Faceless. Thank you. All right. I have a question. So if you have a small team, mm -hmm. they're supposed to do all 16 events? Uh, well, it, ideally it's as, but Pam, it's like what makes sense for um, the kids, right? And where they're at in a, um, in a typical, I mean, if you had a full 15 person team, right, the uh, most kids on a 15 person team do three events over the course of the day. And what that usually means is there are one or two events where they're, I think they're, yeah, there's like two events where they have to be the primary person for the event. So like they're the real main person responsible. They got to be into the topic, really knowledgeable about the rules, that kind of thing. And then there's another one or two events where they're just, they can kind of be along for the ride. You know, they, they're familiar, but. Um, so you divide and conquer, have someone yeah. who's expert in one exactly. of those. Um, and if you don't attend an event, there's a, a scoring penalty. Uh, for not participating in the event. So it's, it's to your advantage to, to try to cover every single event, because if you don't, let's say there's eight teams and you don't show up to an event, you would get nine points for that. 
and you want to get the lowest score possible. Oh, okay. Quick question on that. So I thought I thought there was no penalty if you didn't enroll in the event, but you're saying that whether we have somebody enrolled in the event or not, if we don't show up to that event, there's a penalty? Uh, every yeah. tournament does it a little bit differently, Brooke, but yes, and and generally the the, what we try and get is if you don't show for an event, a no show gets scored differently. Um, so, but you I mean to Dan's point, here's the the reality of it is with a small tournament like you guys have, if it's eight, I mean, and I'm, I don't really have the count, but let's say it's just eight teams, oh. right? So your difference between the worst team in the tournament, right, is you'd get eight points for that event. Or if you don't show up at all, you get nine. So it's, this is where you sort of play the, you sort of make a decision based on what, one, like what kind of, you know, where your kids are at, um, what the event is, all sorts of things, because in a small tournament, the the difference isn't great. But when you get, you know, in theory, if the program grows and we'll have teams down here, well, there'll be 30, 40 teams at the tournament. So with everybody, like it can really end up hurting them um, by not showing up for an event. So can we do that differently? Because that is not how I understood it from our first conversations. And I'm, I'm confident that that's what I've shared with everybody. You can, yeah, you okay. can, like, look, <laughs> this is, that's the, I mean, that's the wonderful beauty of starting it over, right? Mm -hmm. And starting it off is make it, make it work for you guys and make it work, make sense. I mean, the ultimate, the ultimate goal here is for our, I mean, ultimately I want to make sure we have a healthy Alaska program and you're getting a ton of kids involved, but the kids are only going to get involved and that's only going to happen if everybody has a positive experience. So if something, I mean, if something's becoming, I don't want to say you can wipe everything off the table, but if there's a, there's like a, a, a bureaucratic thing, like, Oh, if you don't show up, you're going to get penalty points. Like, you know, who cares? It's, do, does that make sense? And hopefully that, that level of, there's enough of a, a bright line to make that standard sort of make sense in helping with decision-making both for you guys as putting on the tournament, as well as for the coaches kind of helping their kids get ready. If the kids aren't getting excited and enjoying it, like there is, you know, there's sort of defeating the purpose. Right. So I had a question. I'm naive here. So when the students compete, they get so many points for doing it correct. Yeah. So uh -huh. it, de it depends upon the event. So generally uh, for most of it, and if you look at the end of the rules, there's a section called scoring that tells you how the kids are going to be evaluated for the event for most of what we call core knowledge events. So this is where they have to learn a bunch of material and take a test. It's a high score win situation. So the more questions you get right, the more points you accumulate, the better off, you mean the more likely you are to have a top finish in a particular event. When you get to, and that's generally true with lab events as well. And lab events are where they have to learn a bunch of stuff. And then when they show up at the tournament, they do something. So they're like for crime busters, they're going to solve a crime um, and do some lab, do some lab activities to figure out, um, process some evidence and figure out who committed the crime. For build events. So this is like flight and this is like bridge. The scoring gets a little more a little more complex and you can have events where it's not high score winning, it's low score winning. Um, and I apologize, I should, I could double check, but I don't, I don't think of the three I'm most familiar with this year, I think all three build events are high score winning. 
Um, so like bridge, you want to hold, you want, it's a combination of holding the most weight and having, using the least amount of material. So you want a really high efficiency for your bridge. Um, if you get to build a really efficient bridge, you're going to win. Flight, it's having a plane that stays up the longest. Um, wheeled vehicle, it's... Low score. Low score, okay. So wheeled vehicle is the one where you want a low score. Um, and then roller coaster, again, it's a high score. All right, hopefully that, and we, uh, yeah, it, it, and it's sort of dictated by the outcome. And then the, then much like, um, I think like we legitimately ripped this off from the Olympics. The, the higher you finish is like your place basically gets you your points for the event. So a first place finish gets you one point for the event. And then much like a golf match at the end, when we, when all the points for all 16 events are aggregated, the lowest, the lowest score across the events is the overall top team for the, the tournament. And I will tell you, even when, like even at a super competitive tournament, Teams that are winning these things don't do, um, aren't placing first in every single event. And in most cases, they're not even placing in the top 10 in every single event. Um, there's actually a few events where they write, they write the event off entirely and they tend to be down in the, um, towards the lower, I mean, the lower quarter of all teams competing. So like, as you look at this, don't feel like, oh my God, we're only gonna win if we're number one in everything. Absolutely 100% not the case. Um, and I don't know, I may be remembering it incorrectly, but I think, was it you, the year Whiting was at the national tournament? The national champ didn't place first in anything. I, I, that might've been. Yeah. There's, there's been at least one or two years I know where like the national champ was not a, they had no gold medals for the tournament. So, all right, what else? I know there's gotta be some other questions. So feel free, don't, you know. There was a, a question in the chat, and I know I had sent this, I think, to Dan earlier about um, trying to get stuff off wards and having trouble with the shipping. Um, is there any any other ideas of how to, how we can get stuff up here? Um, I do know wards is um, they've been having some stuff. I it depends on what you're looking to what you're looking to buy, you can get, like Wards is our official supplier and it's the nicest because you can just go there and they, they have all the stuff, but you can use other suppliers. So if um, like, there's other people out there that make, um, make plane kits, there's other places where you can just buy balsa wood for the bridge. Um, and the one cool thing, I think if it still happens with wards is if you go on their site, you can actually see the parts list for the kit and what you're getting. So it's sort of, it can help you put together your order, right? You can't necessarily use the part numbers, but you know, okay, I need this size balsa wood, or I need, um, these kind of things for, um, kits. Tara, I do have a, a an email out to the to our our sales rep at Wards, and I just haven't heard back from him with the the questions about that. So um, I don't know if he's looking into it. I kind of explained to him what was going on. So, and hey, Dan, do you have the you have the list of what they're looking the kits they're looking for, or uh, I think it was flight and wheeled vehicle, wasn't it? 
were the the two that uh, the coach had mentioned. And I, I think part of the problem was wheeled vehicles probably got some longer pieces of wood in it. Um, so it's an awkward size would be my guess on why they, their shipping is so high. Okay. Oh, it's the shipping price. Right. Okay. They were charging a, a huge amount of, of shipping. I think Tara said it was like $500 shipping. Oof. So. All right. Yeah. Okay. We'll see if we can get any kind of response on that. Yeah, it was $500 on an $800 order or $400 on a $500 order. <laughs> okay, Brooke, thank you for saying something about that. Um, all right, so Lily's got a question in here about just formed a team today. Don't worry, there's absolutely no, no worry about that whatsoever. So the couple of places you can look for um, study materials. There's a great, um, definitely on our website under the event pages. So go to the specific events. There's a bunch of different resources up there. We also have materials in our, um, the Science Olympiad store that's off of the website. And they're what they're called are starter packs. And they're $10 each. And what you get for most of the events is you get a set of notes that describe the event for you, as well as some key content for the kids. And then every one of them gives you six different um, exams. So there's six practice exams the kids can, can take and use um, that helps, you know, helps them study and practice for the test. The other place to definitely check out is an organization called it's Sciali.org. Okay. And now Sciali.org is our, it's the student run forum. All right. Oh yeah. That's a great one too. Oh, um, the <laughs> Sciali.org is a, the, is a student run forum. This is kids working with kids. Now I will tell you, because it's kid to kid, you do have to have a little bit of buyer beware and you need to make sure your kids understand that they're communicating with other kids. But um, because, it's, because it's Alaska and our, generally kids are really good about, for the most part, trying to be positive and, and helpful. Um, and it's going to, and I'm sure they're going to like the fact that, hey, while I'm talking to somebody, you know, I'm going back and forth with someone in Alaska, it would be a, wouldn't be a bad place to check out. And they have test exchanges and they, they run little quizzes and study guides and all that kind of stuff. And then the one I reckon, uh, like kind of reacted to when Dan put it up is our North Carolina chapter has an awesome set of resources in the the link is in the, the chat. So we'll make sure when everything's said and done and we get to recording up to Tara that we get all these links to her as well. I did put a link in there to the SciAlley.org test exchange. So if you're looking to see what a, a, a test would look like, um, there are a whole bunch of them listed on there. So you can, you can go there as well. Um, and we've also started listing on our event pages um, some of the invitational tournaments that are run throughout the country. They've given us access to their tests that they've already given, um, and we're linking some of those on each one of the event pages. Um, so as we get those in, and that, we, we, we're posting links to, to access those tests. So if you're a coach and you want to give your kids some practice tests or some practice questions, you could access those as well. The just know that your kids can find them as well as as well the only caveat i will put on the the test exchange and the invitationals because you guys are just starting out do not be freaked out if you look at it and go oh my god this is what my kids have to know um because a couple of things one remember it's going to be 
all the tests could be locally created and the folks Tara's working with know, hey, this is everybody's first year. They know the timeline. They know everything else. And the stuff you're going to get off of our website is going to be, it's good, but they're also part of the thing for a lot of these invitationals is they like to brag about having a bunch of teams that will typically be at our national tournament attend the invitation. Um, so it's uh, like, uh, if I can give a give an analogy, my son's on his high school basketball team. This month they're playing each weekend, they're traveling to another tournament around the country where they're playing uh, like top national high school basketball teams. Like they're, I think in two weeks, they're playing a school where all five starters on the team, their dads are playing in the NBA. Um, that's because the other guys on his team, not him, but the, the older guys on the team, um, all five of them have committed to like North Carolina, Illinois, Kansas. They're, they're serious basketball players. You're going to see a little bit of that with some of the science. You're going to see that in, a, in an academic sense with some science Olympiad tests and some science Olympiad tournaments, right? They're like, it's stay away from the stuff that MIT kids are writing. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I've spent years studying science. Like I've spent years teaching science, much like Dan. I don't even think I do well on a damn MIT test. Um, they're out there trying to make sure I think everybody feels um, less like they're, they're working on making sure they're crushing everybody's self-esteem, I think. Um, but so just keep that in mind as you look at stuff. So we got that we did. Um, only other question. I think we kind of touched on this, but so there is a mix of quite like written question and answer and hands on. Um, then the last question that we haven't really gotten to is how do the how do you do stuff about helping the kids, like who participates in what? Um, one of the the things that I've done in the past, and well, I'll Dan give you some tips because he's just got done working with some kids is like, have little like give them the rules let them look at them let them there's a little activities you can have to to try out and do some stuff um simple experiments or give them a couple of questions see if they like if they like a particular topic um and what i've i've done have you ever had the um done a professional development and you do a, a you get a three two one exit ticket when you leave where the idea is you write down three things you're going to do from this like what are three things you're going to go back to your classroom and and do after this professional development what are two things that you'd like to learn more information about and what was one thing that absolutely not you know never in a million years would you ever do this or want to want to try this thing again we do a version of that. I've done a version of that with my with students for Science Olympiad. Tell me what are your three top events? Tell me what are two events you could do that if I had you work in them, you wouldn't complain every single day and <laughs> throw stuff at me. And then, you know, what's the one event? Like if I put if I put you in the event, I'd have to worry about getting, you know, a snowball thrown at me on the way to the car um or something so is one way to collect information from the kids and then kind of sort them um sort them based on that dan, and i know dan you've got better ideas oh. try out um one thing that we always did is we would get the schedule and once we had the schedule we would put the two events in a time block so let's say anatomy and um solar system are going at the same time. What I would do is I would list anatomy and solar system and then have the kids pick which one of those they would want to do. And they could only do one because they're at the same time. So they wouldn't double book and um, that. Um, 
so that's one of the one of the things that we always tried to do is get the the event conflicts to the students ahead of time just so that they knew what they were supposed to be signing up for um and they didn't get two events that they couldn't go to um because that's always a bummer when kids would get the schedule for a different tournament and be like oh three of my events are all in the same hour and i can't do them now um so um that's one of the things that we did um and typically we i would and i did mainly high school we would have the students let us know what their interests were um or if you were their teacher you might want to say hey Susie, you're really good at rocks and you know you really nailed the rock cycle when we we learned about that so maybe you should do rocks and minerals this year you know and and uh one thing that i i, I stress with coaches you can never underestimate the power of a personal invite to get that student to be on your team or to do that event what that can do for them that can totally change their um perspective and their attitude towards it if you say hey you know Susie Ann, i think you're going to be really great at bioprocess lab i think that would be a great fit you've done really well on that unit in class you should you should try that one or or you know whatever it is um that you're, you know, you have with those students, if you know them that well, um, that's always a good way to, to get those guys uh, involved as well. Um, but we did a lot of student interest and, and uh, what classes they've already taken and, and what they were currently taking, um, depending on the curriculum and, and the grade level. Um, there's no real magic there. It's just what your kids are, are able to to want to do and and do so all right other questions as we've talked so just by the fact can i take by the fact that you're still online after an hour we haven't scared you away it's okay if we've terrified you, please let me know so we can change the bit for the next time. All right, then can I, all right, I, selfishly, can I ask two questions? And I'm sure that you guys probably get sick and tired of stupid stuff like this from the, from the continental US. How much daylight did you have today and how cold is it? Well, it depends where you're at in the state. <laughs> okay. Well, just so, well, you guys were all in Fairbanks pretty much, right? Or no? No. Mm -mm. All right. Well, who had the shortest day? Who had the shortest amount of daylight today? Like, what's the worst case today? Um, I think in Fairbanks, we had the sun set around 3.15, was it today? No, it was about 10.30. Yeah, it came up around 10.30. So... But it was above zero, so it was nice. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Um, because we're just yeah. like, we actually got sun down. It we actually got to see the sun today. Um, for the probably the first time in about uh, two weeks ish. Um, you could actually what? Give or take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now the good news though is we had daylight. I mean, sun came up about seven, and I think we had daylight till almost four so we're, we're doing well first week of winter break it was like negative 30 for five days straight oh. <laughs> i'll say today in delta junction it was feels like about negative 15 with the wind chill and i still had kids in crocs and shorts so middle schoolers don't change no matter where you are well, yeah yeah they, yeah. they wear the same thing in florida and alaska yeah. yeah, they don't want anybody to know they own a coat. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just going from the car to the school, right? Like, how long is it going to be? Um, <laughs> that well, I was going to say, John and Dan, if you want me to put in a plug to Jenny about how much we need you guys up here for the event, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> we will gladly take it. Like, you know, you know um, it, I mean, getting getting up there would be awesome. Yeah, I've never been to Alaska yet. So yeah, same. You guys will love it. It's amazing. Well, I don't know, negative uh, 30. Uh, 
Give me a, a positive <laughs> on that. It's not negative 30 inside. <laughs> no. <laughs> we can't. Cold. It's so it's fine. It's fine. right. It's dry, cold. It's not so windy. It's not very windy here. Okay. But I mean, it most likely won't be minus 30, but I can't promise that it oh. won't. <laughs> oh, very good. I promise to keep the delta winds in delta. In delta, okay. we'll get down to about negative 60 would wind chill. Uh, and I no. can promise after negative 20, it all feels the same. You stop <laughs> noticing. Okay. All right. Um, Lily, where in, like, where's Delta? So we are about two hours southwest of Fairbanks. Okay. It's a weird little pocket that like gets the worst wind. Okay. Like Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions or anything for us? If if you have anything or anything comes up, please don't hesitate to um, either reach out through through Tara. You can um, you know call here and leave a message, and we'll get back to you um, when we get back in the office. Um, you, I think you we'll make sure you guys have our emails as well, and we can point you in the direction of resources and that. Um, we'll send you. Uh, we have a couple of slides. We'll send you that kind of highlight different events and like where to look in the rules for particular pieces of information that you may find useful. Um, we'll get you all the links from the chat and we'll keep working on uh, seeing what we can find out about the, the ward situation or if there's a better, um, like closer sourcing uh, for you guys. All right. Um, anything Thanks, else? Guys. Thank you. All right. Thank yeah, you. It really helped. I I was having a hard time. I'm like, yeah, we're gonna do this. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> we're gonna figure it out. And so I feel a thousand percent better and have a good clear idea of what we need to do. So awesome. Um, yeah. the other plug I'll put out there and we'll include it in the links is if you get a chance, we have a Science Olympiad YouTube channel. And there's a bunch of uh, videos up there talking about, like you can watch like how events are gonna be conducted and sort of descriptions about how things should work, as well as there's a couple of hype videos that will allow you to see, um, kind of get an idea of what events might look like um, to give the kids a sense as to kind of sort of what they're getting themselves into. And, and just general YouTube as well. If you YouTube Science Olympiad Wheeled Vehicle, there are student runs, there's how-to videos, there's all kinds of stuff on YouTube and, and on the interwebs. And uh, Suzanne, um, to your question about lead time, I mean, for this year, it's just totally off because we were only approached by the national team about having an event like in August or September. And then it took us time to figure out if we could even do it. Like, cause we were like, you guys, we have no idea what this is. What will it look like at UAF? Can we pull it off? Um, and so we had a lot of discussions between groups trying to find folks who could help and could we make it happen or not? So in forthcoming years, I mean, hopefully, like if this goes well and we everybody wants to continue doing it, which we anticipate will be the case, you know, we'll probably start reaching out to everybody probably before the end of this school year and say, hey, we're going to be doing it again at UAF, you know, think about it for your teams coming up. And then in August, we can touch base again and start recruiting teams once you guys are back in school. Yeah. I thought of a question. It's sort of um, I don't know. I, I participate in some com competitions where you cannot have um, any mention of school or anything like that on your clothing. Um, I'm just wondering, can our teams come up with like their own t-shirts? Can we wear clothing representing our school? Are there any rules like that for the competition? None at all. Um, and there are, so actually the, the, the team t-shirt is kind of a thing in Science Olympiad. Um, and um, teams will go overboard um, on coming up with kind of cool slogans and, and different stuff. And 
I'll never forget the first time I helped to get the program off here in the Chicago public schools, one of our schools showed up and um, they, at the time it was Dunkin' Donuts, big thing was, you know, America runs on Dunkin'. So they ripped that off and said, America runs on science and had a whole thing with the Dunkin' Donuts color scheme and their school name and um, all that kind of, so definitely do that. If you want, um, should you want like logos and all that stuff, you can find it on our website. And if you have difficulty finding it, let us know and we'll make sure you get the, the links to, you know, if you want to put a, the Science Olympiad logo on it or um, whatever. But yeah, feel free to, to go nuts with um, stuff. The only kind of restriction we do have is like all, I mean, like all school stuff, it does need to be respectful. Um, so, you know, they can't go, they can't totally go crazy, but. And, uh, got to stay away from the Olympic rings and anything with Olympics. It has to be Olympiad. Um, and it, it shouldn't have anything to do with the Olympic rings or those color scheme, the, the five colors and, and all of that. And that's all listed on the, on the website, um, under usage for the, the logos and everything. So, um, I actually was going through my keepsake chest and I found my high school science Olympiad shirt. I didn't realize I had, and we had Bart Simpson on the back in a lab coat with uh, a beaker um, in his hand. So, you know, the, one of the students on our team drew it and we got it printed on the back of the shirts and that um, some of the tournaments we've gone to have actually had t-shirt contests where they would, they would go around and look at all the team shirts and pick the best one and, and give a little award to the school with the, the coolest or the funniest team to t-shirt so yeah they definitely something to encourage so um and real quick to suzanne's question that you dropped in chat about the topics yes the um the specific topics are we release them the um tuesday after labor day um if you really want to get an early preview i know dan mentioned we do summer workshops both in person and virtually, where you can get an early look at the topics and the rules as part of the workshop and learn about the events um, some more. But again, it's always, we always hit the, the five big buckets of life science, earth and space, um, physical science, and um, tech and engineering. So like pretty, I mean, if you're doing a, um, an elective or you're doing sort of a, a class, you guaranteed you're gonna have activities that fall into those, um, those categories every single year. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, everybody, it's been wonderful meeting you. Thank you guys for taking the time. Thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, we will get information up to you guys tomorrow. And should you need anything, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. Thank you, guys. Thank it you. was a pleasure. Night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.